Hi guys, welcome to Learn Electronics Repair. This is just a short video really. So, what brought this one about was a video I published just a few days ago with a Class D amplifier that actually had a fault in the circuit that was preventing it from working. And I actually took some voltage readings and then from that drew this diagram just working from data sheets and what I knew was connected to what there's many things I don't know where they connected to and from that with some voltage measurements I could work out what the actual fault was I came to measure the component which I had worked out was faulty and I'd also worked out in what way it was faulty and I was right and I know a lot of you guys enjoyed that video. I'll link it into the description to this one. So if you didn't watch it, it probably makes a lot of sense to go and watch that before you watch this one. The reason for this video was a comment somebody made. It was quite a valid comment. So he basically said, you know, well done, congratulations, well found. And he said, you were lucky because you had another working child to compare with. So... I could compare the readings between a good one and a bad one and that's what enabled me to find the fault. I did reply to that and saying, well Luke, you know, when you're working on amplifiers in particular, almost always there's more than one channel, so it's not quite as lucky as you think because that's the usual sort of situation. But in actual fact, it would have been simple enough to actually diagnose this fault without a good chance to compare with. All the evidence is there. So let's have a look at it again. We'll just look at the readings I'm taking on the bad channel. We won't look at the ones on the good channel, compare the two. And let's see how we would have diagnosed this fault given the evidence we have without a good chance to compare with. So here is the PCB. This is a still frozen from the video. So let's have a look to see what we have. The problem was on this channel, okay? This one. This is the bad channel. So we're going to look at this in isolation, okay? Now the resistors, this is the area where the fault was. This one actually goes to the junction of the MOSFET. So we have on the class D amplifier, we have a MOSFET like so, and we have another MOSFET like so. This is connecting to ground, naught volts, and this end is connecting to plus 150. Okay? volts this is then driven the two mosfets okay by the mosfet driver d r v and that is then controlled by the pulse width modulator so the pulse width modulator comes in here this was from an op amp lm319 comparator actually so it was like that basically that's the circuit we have so this op amp is actually that one okay and then we have the same on the other channels there's four channels so this is channel four three two and channel one is hidden under this connector okay so the voltage readings i have here is 150 volts okay here so this is the junction between the two resistors is 2.25 volts okay and then here all the end of the resistor is 2.21 volts okay that's what i have now this tells me straight away a few 
things and he basically tells me where the fault is. So I'll explain to you why that is enough information even without a good channel to compare with. With a Class D amplifier, when it's idle, so effectively there is no audio signal coming in, the output, this, this point here, okay, so this is effectively the connection that goes to one end of your speaker, which is here, okay. This point is at half the supply voltage, so it's at 75 when the thing is idle. The cone is in the middle of the speaker, and the audio waveform drives it more positive or more negative to move the cone in and out. That's the way a speaker works. For there to be 75 volts, which is half supply voltage on here, these MOSFETs must be switching off and on at very high frequency, that's how a Class D works, at a duty cycle of 50%. So they're on and off for an equal amount of time each. So here, what we should have is a square wave, hundreds of kilohertz, or many, many, I'd say into the hundreds of kilohertz, and the duty cycle is 50%. Okay, now straight away I can see there's 150 volts here. The only reason for that is that this MOSFET is being turned on and this MOSFET is being turned off. I know by the way neither of the MOSFETs are short. I measured for that earlier so I don't have a shorted MOSFET. So 150 volts on here must mean that this one is switched on and this one is switched off. And that is a fault. So straight away, I know I have a fault. Now, I have one resistor here. We know 150 volts on. I have 2.25 here and 2.21 here. That's telling me that this resistor has a very large voltage drop across it. This one has a very small voltage drop across it. So the resistors are the same value, 3002, which is uh, 30K. Yeah. They're both the same value. So if this one has a much higher voltage drop than this one, this must be passing a lot more current than this one. The formula, just Ohm's law, V, I, R, okay. If we want to know the current, it's V over R. R is the same in both cases, 30,000. And V, well, on the top one, it's 150 minus 2, basically 148 volts. And on the other one, it's 2, over, over 300,000. Okay, let me just calculate those. So this one is passing 148 over 30,000 which is uh, 4.9 milliamps. Okay. And the other one is passing 66 microamps. Okay. So if that is happening, the only way it can happen is if a lot of the current is actually going, you see there's another track, we don't know where it goes to, but there's a track here which goes somewhere. So almost all of the current would have to flow that way. Yeah, and a tiny bit would have to flow this way. Now, there's no particular reason why that couldn't be the case. But look, both resistors are the same value. What else do they have in common? You can look at them. What else do they have in common? They're both the same size. 
Okay, they are both the same physical size. These are 1206. That's uh, effectively 12 meters. Well, it depends if they're metric or if they are imperial. Okay, they're either 12 one hundredths of an inch by 6 one hundredths of an inch, or they are 12 millimeters by 6 millimeters. I haven't measured them. I actually figured this out by taking some different size capacitors that I knew what size they were and put one against the resistor and I put a 1206 capacitor against one it's the same size so they're 1206 and if we google that 1206 wattage to see what the maximum wattage is for a resistor of this size you'll find that it's 500 milliwatts okay but even without doing that and without going to the size you know they're both the same okay We'll look at that in a minute, but they're both the same. So without going down this step, if they're both the same size, don't you think the circuit designer expected them to be both effectively passing the same current or in the same ballpark and have the same voltage drop across them? Yeah, to pass the same current, they would have to have roughly or exactly the same voltage drop. So just from looking at it, it's obvious that the current is supposed to flow that way, not this way down this other track, okay? Because just look at them, same value, same size. I actually made a big mistake here, by the way. I'll correct it now. Perhaps you didn't spot it, but there's 140 volts across this resistor, 150 minus two basically there isn't two volts across this resistor there's 2.25 minus 2.21 which is actually 0 0.04 of a volt so this calculation is wrong and that is 1.3 microamps okay if that really was the case, this would be minuscule. They put the tiniest resistor. You could imagine here. Yeah. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So once we get to that point, we realize now there's only two possible causes of this problem. Either we have a short from here or a very low resistance because there's a tiny bit of voltage there to ground, not volts. This could be, for example, something like a short circuit diode or something like that, you know, maybe like a, it, there's supposed to be a Zener diode here, but then there would be a resistor in series anyway. So I think we can scrub that idea. Yeah. Maybe there's supposed to be a transistor from here. That sort of thing for some reason. Okay, can't think why, but something like that. We know this track goes somewhere. So we've either got something like that with a very low resistance to ground. Or the other possibility is this resistor is open circuit or very near to open circuit. Okay, in our case, that was open circuit. It measured about 4.4 mega ohms in circuit. It measured open out of circuit. And then the final step, if that's open, why is it gone open? Well, that could be some short circuit from this end. So then I check from here to ground. Do we have a short? No. We could have a short to some other voltage rail, but ground seemed like the most obvious one. That's why I went for that one. So then I know I actually have a Duff open circuit resistor. And you see, we can work that out just using the voltages that we have here without comparing with a good one. Because logically, it makes sense that the current flowing through this is very similar to the current flowing through that because they're the same size as each other. So that's how I would have worked this one out anyway. Oops, I've managed to mess up my diagram a bit and lost the A off the microamps and 
shifted the pits for a bit, but there's just one other thing I want to mention. We know there's another track coming from here, okay? We know in actual fact, yes, from a good channel, that the voltage drop across this one is a bit less than the voltage drop across that one. And we can work out from the voltage drop that this one is passing a bit more current than that one. So that bit more current that this is passing, the only sensible place I can see that coming from is this track that comes into here that we don't know where it goes to, or in this case, comes from. So it looks like we also have a small amount of current flowing this way as well. And that's why I think, but I don't know for certain, when this one measured completely open out of circuit, I still had a little bit of a voltage drop across that one. Because if this is open, nothing's flowing this way. But I think something's coming in that way. Oh, and I almost forgot. If this is supposed to have 148 volts across it, which means it's passing 4.9 milliamps, what's the wattage dissipated in that resistor? Well, it's 148 times in amps, naught point naught naught four nine. Sorry, guys, and that comes to naught point seven three five watts which exceeds the rating of the component. So there's many, many things here that tell us that these readings are wrong. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. I thought it was worth doing that because these are really the techniques you need for fault finding. Understanding what's in front of you. As somebody else commented on the previous video, and I totally agree with this, Take these readings. If something is wrong, but you can't quite figure out what is wrong, go away and think about it for a while. Put it down. Just keep it in your mind. Or maybe not think too much. I don't think too much. And I'll wake up probably four in the morning the next day. And I think, I know what's wrong with that. In this case, actually, it wasn't when I did the original one. I actually had left the office before I did the second part of that video. And I'd walked down to the office because the weather's just so gorgeous at the moment. It's 10 minutes or so walk to the house. And while I was walking, I actually figured out what was wrong with it. So, you know, just moving away from the job. Think about it a bit. And I think you'll surprise yourself. That it'll come back with some good ideas of what to do next. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. Comment again. Thank you to the subscriber who asked that question. Or rather, not a question, who sort of said, well, you're just lucky. Not really. It could have been worked out anyway. Thanks for watching, guys. I look forward to seeing you all soon again on Learn Electronics Repair.